It is truly a great honor to introduce our keynote speaker to you. Um, we've talked a couple of times about, you know, Vince and I have claimed we've been around Jock for a long time and we cite things that happened in the 90s. So you're gonna hear from a true pioneer of job order contracting and IDIQ contracts for, um, for construction and you're gonna hear from a voice that actually founded the systems. You're gonna hear from someone who actually in the 1980s brought these concepts to West Point, and from there it phased out into other, juris other federal jurisdictions. So you're gonna hear the real truth about how these things started, and the real truth about the leadership that it took to make those changes, and the academic career that followed. You're gonna hear from 52 years of experience in academia and in the military that is just, for me, awe-inspiring and, and wonderful to hear about. And the best part, which is not even in your, in your write-up, is you're going to hear from a gold medal Senior Olympics winner this year in racquetball. So we're talking physical, intellectual, academic, everything right here in one package. So without anything else, because I know he's got some details in his slides that he's going to share with you, it is my great and distinct honor to introduce to you Dr. Bill Badger. The thing about the racquetball, nobody says I was playing well. They said, I hope I'm playing racquetball when I'm your age. <laughs> so they complimented my age more than the racquetball skills. I'm going to ad lip as I go through this, and I hope I can not repeat stuff before it comes out on the slide. But I, I looked at it. And the first part is I'm gonna talk about Jock. And then my daughter, who works for the big utility company, S SRP, I found out uh, last week that she handles the Jock contract. So in my family, uh, and she helped me out. But as I sit there, you, this group knows more about Jock than I ever do because I kind of walked away from Jock 30 years ago. Uh, I was uh, at West Point and they asked me to uh, be on a green, green, ribbon, green ribbon panel to study how to improve the post engineering function throughout the Army. And when I got there, I, I was looking at procurement people and lawyers and getting contracts uh, for the job. And it really amazed me what I found, and I'll share that with you. So looking at this, I looked at this, and I thought I'd start off with safety. And I noticed right away he didn't have safety glasses or hearing protection. And you laugh a little bit, but as a senior person, when people would come in and brief me, the project managers or I would be a project manager and brief something. Uh, we'd have these energetic people that would have a hundred pieces of information. And old Prado's law says 80% is just noise, only 20% really mean things. So I selected something I call dominant information. And in any type of briefing, there's only about six or eight items that's important. And I found out throughout my career, the most important is the safety aspect. So I try to start everything with safety. Now, what would be those uh, dominant information about uh, working with your project managers or your project managers working with these people? Well, quality work is one. On schedule is another. Within budget is another. And, and then we, we kind of look at relationships uh, because of communication, and that's always important. But the problems, most people will talk about current problems. And most people will talk about reactive managers. They solve a lot of problems. And I found out that if I had an organization, I would get everybody together and have them do 10 items in the coming year. That would be a problem that would really just screw us good, mess us up good. And so you recognize those 10 things that you're not gonna let happen. 
you sign person a responsibility. And after the first year, you reward the people that kept bad problems from happening. Become a strategic thinker, not a reactive manager. So you want to play chess, not checkers. But all the recognition seems to go by, oh, this person solved all these problems for us, a reactive manager. And I, I want to stress that a strategic thinker is 10 times more valuable to you than the reactive manager. Uh, at West Point, it was a major command, West Point. So I was the engineer for the major command. I also was the director of engineering and housing. And, and I, I got there, and I'm saying, well, if you don't realize what the job is, then I'll go over that in a minute. When I hit academia, I had two weeks' notice to put down my uniform and get in the classroom. And so I, I was at ASU, I walked in the first classroom and nobody stood up. I said, hell, what did I get into here? <laughs> but anyway, they didn't quite down and so forth. And so I had a rule about cell phones. And the rule is you can have a cell phone, it can ring, but I want you to stand up and tell a joke. So any of you let your cell phone ring, uh, we'll let you stand up and tell us a joke. And so uh, I don't mind if your cell phone is not off. I give a presentation in Las Vegas to Jim Rhodes, Rhodes Home. It was a $2 billion residential contractor. And he had 80 people that he wanted me to teach every other Saturday morning. And so the first time we were all there and I made that comment about the cell phone and old Jim Rhodes, he reached in and got his cell phone, turned it off, laid it on the table. Well, the first break, he went out in the hall, and his minions sneaked in, turned his telephone on. <laughs> so I come back, and I start talking, and five minutes in my presentation, his phone rang. And everybody in the room says, joke, joke, joke. <laughs> he stood up and told the dirtiest, raunchest joke. <laughs> I have heard in my life, but everybody laughed. And I, I got a ruling out of that. If you own the company, you can tell any damn joke you want. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, a, I'm not a true academician. Uh, I went out and worked as a construction laborer early in my career out in Houston. And my math teacher uh, that taught me four years and her her husband, mechanical drawing teacher, took me, taught me four years. And, and they knew that I didn't have a family. I was living in a boarding house. So on 10 December of 1953, they sent me a telegram. It says, Bill, we sent your record to Alabama Polytech Institute. And you have been accepted. Do you want to go? And I thought about that. I had it in my pocket. And the Houston Canal in December is cold, so I was by the burn barrel. And I'm standing there, and the topic of conversation among the laborers around the burn barrel was to see who could fart the loudest. And I looked, and I thought, you know, I can do better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so two weeks later, I got on a train and went back to Mobile, Alabama. And Alabama Polytech happens to be in a town called Auburn, Alabama. So I went up to Auburn, and I signed up and took the full-day exam, and I ranked in the upper 2% mathematics. I felt so good. And then they pulled up the English score, and I ranked 98 percentiles. That means 98 people out of 100 knew more about English than I did. I said, oh, hell. And so the average was 51%, and I'm feeling pretty good. And the lady looked at me and said, and 50% of the people flunk out. I thought, well, I got it made by 1%. So I had to get some rules for how to get it done. And I, I realized I was dyslectic, and 5% of the people are dyslectic, and I have a hard time writing and even speaking. And so I made a rule. I would never miss a class. I would go to every class. I couldn't take notes because I couldn't spell the damn words. I'd go back to the room get the chapter in the book, and I would mark everything I could remember the professor put emphasis on it. 
And so I finally worked three months, go to school three months, six years. I wound up as a mechanical engineer. Six weeks later, Uncle Sam wrote me a letter and said, now you're a lieutenant. <laughs> Come to Fort Belvoir, and I did. But I stayed in the military as long as I was successful. And, and it was the people skill part of it, the leadership part, because if you had good fitness reports, they would send you to more schools. So they sent me to five schools, five years, above the, the average officer. And I wound up with a PhD and a graduate from the Army War College. And, and that kind of helped me out. And so I calculated the other day how much money was spent on me. They spent $500,000. In the 26 years in academia, they only spent 300000 and I wanted at least to get to a million, but I think I'm gonna fall short. <laughs> but but anything, I, I think you have to invest in education. Uh, and, and as I try to write the, the books, uh, I find that I don't type very well, but I use Dragon Natural Speak and I dictate. And for the last 25 years, I've had a full-time editor because if you have a weakness, you find someone to delegate it to, <laughs> to take care of it. So on these slides, when you see the, I left off of an ED or an S, a verb subject agreement, please just smile and don't say anything. <laughs> uh, I think the idea of thinking time, uh, we did uh, a two week course at the University of Texas at Austin and myself and my thinking partner, another professor, did the first two days of leadership. Uh, and the, the idea that we found was that you have to have a thinking partner. And I'll cover that a little more later. West Point, I was the, they have a, West Point has its own Army uh, headquarters. So I was the engineer, but I was also the director of engineering housing. And, and you could see what, as the engineer, I, I was managing about 51% of the annual budget, training budget for West Point. Now the, the salaries and the rest of that was to somebody else, but strategic planning. And, and so you, you can imagine it was a, a good job. I had two deputies, uh, a, a Lieutenant Colonel Johnson and a Lieutenant Colonel Harry Mellon. And if you, New Harry Mellon, you would remember him, because he's been in jock for many years. The challenge, I found out that we had to let a design contract and procurement would run me around the 90 to 180 days, then the de design the project, and then we'd have to let a construction contract, 90 to 180 days, and then we'd have to let it, then we'd have to do it. But we couldn't do a $100,000 small project in a year. And West Point, I could put in for year-end money, and all the alumni, the generals, made damn sure West Point got the money. And so we just could not let the contracts. And so I was selected for a green ribbon uh, panel representing West Point to how to improve the Army post around the United States. And so this uh, thing was, how can we do better? And I knew we were doing poorly. When you looked, that <laughs> everything we could not do in one year, and, and we had to uh, go back and get those year-end funds, we needed better reaction time. And so as we go, uh, in 1984, the, uh, the green ribbon, or uh, blue ribbon, green ribbon panel, and we went to the core worldwide facilities engineer conference. And I had Lieutenant Mellon with me, Harry, and we were sitting with a Brigadier General Helms, and we were briefing him on jock. And nobody in the Army, I don't know anywhere else, was doing jock. The chief of engineers, Val Heiberg, come and sit down and say, can I have breakfast with you? So he got a five-minute briefing on jock. And guess what? He fell in love with it. So as the chief sat there and heard about it, 
uh, he, he got up to speak and he talked about Jock. He heard it for five minutes, liked it, got up and talked to all these colonels from all the different army posts and says, we're doing this. Now what happened though, was they took my deputy <laughs> and transferred him to Washington. So I lost the good deputy and Harry. But anyway, Jock come online and, and we felt like we were moving forward. And a reality, the chief was fascinating. Everyone uh, liked the idea after the chief liked it. So there's a ruling. If you get support from the boss, uh, you know, if, if you manage change, you, you know what drives change? Number one driver of change is something that really, a, a caliph, I guess, worst thing in, a, in the world could happen. And a crisis is the number one driver of change. The number two driver of change, if the boss says, damn it, you're gonna do it or else, that's number two. Number three driver of change, when smart people get together and figure out a better way to do it, and everybody agrees. It's difficult to get everybody to agree. But anyway, uh, we, we had that thing and I thought about it and said, well, uh, it, it's uh, continued to develop jock and I lost a good deputy. West Point become the first test site for the new jock concept. And however, I did receive the Army, uh, Army Accommodation Medal for the Green Panel Study. Uh, guess what? Harry retired and started his own company and become a millionaire. I become an acquisition on food stamps. So <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know you can have a good idea, but if you don't ride that horse, then, then something else happens. Uh, the reality, and, and I'm going to ad lib this a little bit, uh, as the colonel, and I controlled the money, I found that I had to keep the procurement people out of the process. I hope there's no procurement people here. But anyway, <laughs> then I had to keep uh, the lawyers out of the process. And so I said, I want the person at West Point who understood what needed to be done and the person for the jock contractor who knew what needed to be done. And both of those people had to have, they had to know the language of construction. I wanted construction people talking to construction people. And folks, when you have somebody in the system and they don't know the language, you get in trouble. And don't, I hope there's nobody, don't hire anybody to help manage you because you get all the damn management you want. You want them outside, you don't want them inside. Because a manager, they feel, I'm not earning my money. I haven't got out and made a decision. And the more people in the management side that feels like they have to enter into it, the more the project will cost you and the less your profit. You've got to keep it down to that one person from the contractor, the one person from the facility that knows the problem. Those two people have to uh, scope out the work. So the first thing we had to do is one contract, not two. It had to be open-ended. We had to have people handling the passage back and forth that knew engineering and maintenance. They had to know the language of construction. And we had to keep other people out. And when you found a good job contractor, then repeat business. And the contractors were smart. They realized the better they did on each work order, the more work orders they got. We hired four the first time around. One did a crappy job. And he come to see me after I called him and told him he wasn't going to get any more work orders. He said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, show me that in the open-end contract. I don't have to give you work orders. He says, Colonel, let me redo the project at no cost. He redid the project. So I give him another one. He learned that if he did quality work, he would get more job order contracts. There was that incentive there. And so we, we were successful. 
uh, West Point ran it, then it was accepted by DA, Department of Army, and we started running throughout the Army. I taught it a couple, three years from 1985 to about 1991 or two. And I had a Air Force major coming to ASU to get his PhD, and so he wanted to take my contracts class. And he walked in the time I was getting ready to give jock, and he says, Professor, can I tape your presentation? And he did. <clears throat> Two weeks later, he's very energetic, Dean Kasawagi, Dr. Kasawagi, come back with a 20-page jock article. And I think we put it up on your website. It's dated in 1991, and I think it was the first article about jock that hit, hit print and cost engineering. Well, I kind of got away from it, and I, <laughs> I said, okay, uh, as we go, these were my goals. Uh, we wanted it open in contract. We wanted to do a set of specifications for every one of the jobs. And then we did 10 sample jobs, and we did each cost. We had a cost book. So we had the specification, the cost book, and the guidelines. And the guidelines was that these two people would get together, and they would do the scope of work on the job, on the, on the job order. And it got where it was turning out projects every 30 to 60 days. And we got about 30 million extra dollars from DA. And we did so many jobs. We cleaned West Point up with Jock. And that's when the Army bought into Jock. So having said all of that, uh, I said, well, uh, I need to get educated. So SRP is one of our utilities of water and electricity. And so I, I called over and, and I found out that there was a lady and she handled all the construction contracts. That lady was my daughter. <laughs> she graduated from the Delaware School. I, we never talked about jock, but here she was doing $28 million a year in jock, uh, 284. So they were around 900,000 a piece, or, or 300,000 a piece, I guess it was. Then my nephew, who graduated from Dale Webb School, uh, his, his name's Badger, and uh, he's senior vice president of a big company, and all he does is jog. And his son is a Badger down in uh, Tucson, and he works for the state government down there, the, the water part of uh, the county. And he was doing job. And so I was just amazed how Jock grew. And so I, I looked and I says, uh, please, uh, folks, uh, I don't want you to ask me too much questions about Jock. I'm sitting there and you have acronyms I've never heard of before. And I thought, OK. So they know something I don't know, so they are better educated. And so I went through with what SRP was doing job order bid list, uh, evaluation criteria, uh, bidders list, approved list. Uh, and I looked at these things and I said, maybe you understand them more than I do. But I can imagine that for different sized companies in counties, states, cities, and different large companies and small companies in different states, you have about six differences if I was doing research, then I would find the best practices in each of those six groupings and say, here's the best practice. But I, I, no, I'm not going to do that my age anymore. I do leadership. Okay, but anyway, that uh, bidder pre-qualified, uh, the qualification questionnaire, what they are looking for. And I'm sure if you're interested in any of this from SRP, uh, I'm sure my presentation will be on your, uh, uh, your website. Uh, user group considerations, a special thanks for SRP, there's my daughter, and so forth, and we celebrate doing well, and there's my daughter at 42, her husband who works for SRP. He was my grad student, and I told him if he didn't marry my daughter, he wouldn't get his master's degree. <laughs> and, but, uh, Somebody says, Bill, 
write a chapter on the skills that made you competitive. So I wrote down 26 of them, and Sean went out and did a survey, and we got an extra leadership principle from each uh, person that took the test. These were for the senior instruction folks. We wound up with a test for 52, went out again and took it. 80% of the senior leaders in the construction industry pick respect all people as number one. And then I collected all the data on my 190 leadership wisdom, and the number one wisdom was be a nice person. I said, damn, I spent 14 years, and it's so obvious. As I met people in this audience, you seem to all be nice people. And so those things, be a nice person and respect everyone. And so nice people do finish first, not last. And I, I hope that is good. Now to be nice, you can't get mad, blow up, and shoot people out. So I have a one that you can't get angry. You measure each day you go without getting madder, mad and, and calling people out. And you keep a score. One time I was getting ready to break a thousand days, three years, and one of my assistants screwed up so bad. Everything was wrong. It was a morning briefing with the industry and so forth. And he rode over with my other assistant and he says, Matt, you ride back. I'm going to ride back with Dr. Badger. And I hadn't said a word. I just biting my tongue. I got in my maxima and he got in. And he's like, he's picking on my sore. I chewed him out, damn near wrecked my car. <laughs> and he says, I haven't been chewed out like that since I was a corporal in the army. But then I had two weeks, three weeks, four weeks for forgiveness, reconnecting each other. Folks, you, you as a professional, you don't have the right to get mad. You're on the stage every day and everybody's watching you. And so they watch what you dress, they watch what you drink, they watch and so forth. And so I, I think leadership is good and I'm gonna talk about that a little later. Uh, in summary, you know more about the process than the owner. And anytime you ask a less gifted person a hard question, they won't know the answer and they will resent you. You have to get the information without making the, making the owners feel like they don't know. And by the way, if you have a boss and the, your boss is less gifted than you are, you gotta be careful of the questions you ask the boss. And so realize that everybody doesn't have the same intelligence. And so when I meet somebody, I know this sounds condescending, I try to evaluate their knowledge base because you want to be able to get the information and you have eight encounters a day. When that other person walks away from you, that other person needs to feel that that was a win-win obligation. And so you, every time, and so we will talk about wisdoms later on and, and what you can do that will help you have positive relationships. I'm sure that each state, I know you have different acronyms. <laughs> and I, I'm sitting there and I didn't get much out of it because in 30 years, things have changed. And I didn't realize that you had a licensing program and you could get licensed. And I'll talk about that later. I, I did the jock Article 91, and I kind of walked away from it. Then I spent my time as school director and researching leadership after that. So the leadership, 14 years research and a lifetime of practice. My concept was to break leadership down in small DNA units, the DNA of leadership. And so I said, I will get leadership wisdoms that you should be using. Now, the next book I'm working on now, and I'm about six months away, is I've taken the five levels of leadership. You learn level zero, and then you move over to level one, a individual worker by yourself. Level two, 
you're leading teams. In level three, you're a mid-level manager. Level four or five, you're a senior executive. And as you go through career progression, your people that follow you are smarter and more experienced. So at every career level, you need new leadership principles to be using. Now, some of those being a nice person and respected, you use throughout your career. But you need to learn the new leadership wisdom at each level. If you don't, you won't move from level two to level three, or you won't move level three. And when I was teaching at the University of Texas for CII, they had level four people who want to make the, the leap to be a senior leadership. And a lot of them don't want to play the price. So you have to learn different leadership wisdoms when you jump to that next level. Uh, we looked at it, and we see that the benefit of continuing education shows up all the time. You, you never get where you not have to learn something new. Uh, after your uh, <clears throat> value of leadership wisdoms, that uh, alignment, each person breaks uh, leadership style is different and it's different on your personality and your experience. You can't learn leadership from someone else. You have to learn it for yourself. And I'd like to ask everybody in here, if there's one wisdom I, I cite, I'd love to have you write it down and give it to me. I want to find out what the gold nugget says that you get out. And uh, how am I doing? Oh, I'll slow down and tell some more jokes. Uh, in the most frequently mentioned leadership wisdoms, number one, if you go and search it out, is communication, actively listening. Number two is enthusiasm. When you have something that's good, be excited about it. That, that, you know how you did when your young daughter or son at three years old was potty trained? You celebrated, you give her cookies, you did all those things. But anyway, uh, enthusiasm. Number three is humor. And may I tell a blonde joke? Anybody in the room that would be offended? Just, just me, doctor, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell one. Here we go. <laughs> Beautiful 26-year-old blonde. And she was having a good day. She was happy. And she went out to the elevator and hit the button. And it opened, and an old man like me was standing there in the back of the elevator. And this young blonde says, TGIF. And he looked at her. She said, TGIF. And he looked at her, and she says, thank goodness it's Friday. Oh, he smiled. She got on the elevator, and he says, S-H-I-T. <laughs> she looked at him, and she, he says, S-H-I-T. And she, was, she didn't know what to do. He said, sorry, honey, it's Thursday. <laughs> and I only tell that joke on Thursdays. <laughs> so it's Thursday, so I tell that joke. OK. But humor is number three. It relaxes people. And they used to say, oh, Colonel Badger, he has the worst jokes going. But they all laughed. And when I was a battalion commander, I played racquetball. And I could whip everybody in the battalion racquetball. And young lieutenants would be tongue-tied around the commander, but they could always talk about racquetball because that was free territory. On my going away 22 months in command, my going away party, every table had a broken racket on it <laughs> and racquetball balls. So uh, it, was a, it was a thing that I related with people playing racquetball with them. But anyway, uh, be enthusiastic. Use humor. Now, let's see what we got here. Oh, I, I looked and there was 22,000 leadership wisdoms that they recommend to you. So I had to do my own. When your people want to do things, you're a leader. When your people have to do things, you're a manager. And when, when they want to do things, they work over the weekend, they work through breaks. And so if you listen to people and 
there's a wisdom that senior people use is get people to work on their own idea instead of your ideas. And so when they come in and there's a problem, ask them, how can we solve this problem? And if they come up with a good idea, you smile, you, you thank them, say, that's great. Then you assign them to take care of that. Then you have them working on their idea, not your idea. If you come in and say, oh, I got a good idea, I want you to work on this, they won't work as hard as if they come in and you talk to them and they come up with it and make a recommendation to you. And if it's close, hey, thank you, Mary, Sally, Billy, Joan, or whatever, would you do that for me? And so they got them working on their ideas, not yours. Okay. My oldest quote is, you're hired for your technical skills, you're fired for your lack of people skills, and you're promoted for your leadership and management skills. We had a good example. We had a young civil engineer smarter than a whip, but he had a poor personality. He got a job three months, he got laid off. And he came back thinking, I didn't know enough. Entered the graduate program two years later, got a master's degree, got a job three months later, they laid him off. He come back, entered the PhD program, got a PhD. That's how we get our faculty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership is not new. I researched 600 uh, BC, the old master, and he came up with Taoism. Uh, and so I, I thought, well, he's pretty damn smart. And so Effective leadership is like water, is a clean and reflects all creatures without judgment or prejudice. Uh, my Chinese students, as I, they were researching this for me, they couldn't figure out whether it's judgment or, <laughs> or, or uh, persistence or, uh, but anyway, that's as close as we could get it. And he come out and he says, true leaders uh, are hardly known by their followers. Now, I left out the two poor leaders are hated by their followers. But true leaders are hardly know, uh, known to their followers. Great leaders are th those where people say, we did it ourselves. You don't have to be uh, on TV every week telling everybody how great a leader you are. And by the way, I research leading from behind. That's bullshit. <laughs> So you can't lead from behind. I don't care how they, they dress that up. I won't talk any more politics, okay. <laughs> uh, you've got to be yourself. You've got to know yourself. So the first thing in, in the book uh, is a case study about you understanding yourself. And there's like 35 uh, groupings and you go through the case study chapter and it will tell you uh, which, what grouping you fall in. And everybody's different. And, but you need to know yourself. For the first uh, transition model is know yourself first if you want to become a leader. And so knowing yourself is very, very important. Uh, 14 years of leadership research uh, based on the smallest DNA element, which we call the wisdoms. And so my, my book that you're getting has 190 leadership words. The new one I'm working on uh, is 145 wisdoms. And I found something out recently. I have a group of four in each team looking at the 190 leadership wisdom and have them categorize the wisdom as intuitive wisdoms or counterintuitive wisdoms and actionable. So the formula is you take counterintuitive actions minus the intuitive action and add the actionable and give that number. So I come up with 23 wisdoms that were counterintuitive. If it's intuitive, you probably recognize it and you probably tried to implement it. Counterintuitive, you don't recognize it and you haven't tried to implement it. So the, you have to find out which is counterintuitive to you and then learn 
the reason why it's true. And then you have to figure out how to implement it. So in my next book, I'm gonna do the wisdom, a paragraph about the wisdom, and a sample on how to implement it. Knowing the wisdom and not implementing it won't help you. So we really did a lot of work on where the leadership wisdoms were learned. So we tried to place them in level zero, one, two, three, four, uh, five. And so if, you, if, if we don't know where they're learned, people would tell us. And so we think we have the wisdoms uh, where learned uh, in the right place. And so I, I think that's kind of important to know. I found out that the leadership management curve looks like that. And we do education and training. And that moves you to the right balance between leadership and management. Folks, all management or all leadership is not what you've got to do. You've got to get the right balance. And we, from other uh, activities, uh, we say that probably if, if you're a project manager, you should be doing 60% leadership and 40% management. Folks, you have to manage. You have to keep the money straight. You have to keep the rules straight. And so what happens when a young person goes learn leadership and comes back, uh, if he works for a micromanager, the boss will say, you're not going to use any of that here. And so there's pressure to push that leadership back. And those pressures are kind of people uh, are naturally resistant to change. Uh, and we see that uh, they will resist change and so forth as you go through. So those are the pressures that push back on you trying to implement leadership. If you're fortunate and you start out working for a leader and you learn that, you're fine. Some people are not fortunate. They start working for a micromanager, and they're not bad people. They just was in a situation where they learned the wrong thing. Now, this guy, Farr, uh, did a really a good job. And you see the student and individuals all the way up to the senior people. And you see the technical skills, the human skills, and the leadership skills. At this top level, you're doing 80 or 90% leadership. Uh, if you can't stop doing the technical work and put it behind you and start doing the management work, and if you can't stop doing that and put it, you can't move from one level to the next level. A lot of people don't want to learn a new level. A lot of people don't want to learn a new computer or learn the, how to use their cell phone. And, and folks, every one of you have a cell phone. You have all the knowledge in the world on your cell phone. If you looked up George Washington tomorrow for 20 minutes, the next day look up John Adams for 20 minutes and read it, the next day Thomas Jefferson, and the sixth day John Quincy Adams, and right on through, after 45 days, you have the equivalency of a master's degree in political science and American government. If you're not getting educated, then it's you because you're lazy. There's a, a, a guy named Prager, Dennis Prager. He has 300 five-minute videotapes. And they, they have all kind of, one is on happiness, one is on forgiving. And, and so and the, these people are out there and you've got all of this knowledge. You don't need to spend money going back to the university and go in debt. All you gotta do is spend 30 minutes a day, and you, you can learn all these things. Okay, there is the wisdoms broken down. Uh, I have got feedback. So in the book, the top 10 are the top ranked ones, five. And, and so as we see that, uh, we have the better person, and we say be a nice person is number one and uh, sustained niceness is the leadership wisdom. Respect all people, and those are the magic words. My mother, being from Alabama, if I didn't say thank you, you're welcome, please, yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir, I wouldn't get the cookie. And so I did that all as a young person. Then I went in the military, and as the boss, 
the magic word is good job. Academia, uh, the magic word is good question. 57 years of marriage, I am sorry. <laughs> so you, you gotta know the magic words. Yeah. Uh, Self-help graciously. Uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. And I, I did this because I needed help getting through the university. But when I went in the military, and I kept asking people to help me, everybody wanted to help the lieutenant, the captain, the major, the colonel. And, and when they got all the credit, you were very gracious, give all the credit if it's successful. You take the failures, you don't blame that on anybody. That become a leadership trait in the military. People wanted to work for me because they would get credit for something if they did it. Okay, we're all the captains of our own ship. And you gotta get to young people and say, folks, uh, whether you get through the college or not or the university, it's up to you, but uh, you have to go to class, you have to pass class, you have to pay for the tuition and all this, and after four years, you get uh, a diploma. And hopefully you'll get a good job. But anyway, the, the idea of being the captain of your own ship, a lot of people think that the system owes me, that it's the, advi uh, the advisor's fault if I don't get the right information. And I, automatically, the day one they entered the Dell Webb School, which I had for 18 years, what I would go over on the captain things. And, and you look at living, learning, um, creating, re helping, that's for you guys. The one for the students was, Drinking, no, I won't go into those. But, uh, <laughs> golden rule, the old golden rose, who has the gold rules? Then the one I use in my lifetime, treat people how you ought to be treated. Do you know what the new golden rule is? Treat people how they want to be treated. You know all your people, you know how they want to be treated, and so you want to do this to help them to maximize their performance. You don't have to treat everybody the same. You treat everybody according to their need. Uh, this is the individual professional, a smile. Folks, if you smile, automatically people think you're successful. So, so a smile is that. So I have a, a thing I try to do every day and, and that smile is I try to make 12 people smile every day. Okay, you grow or you go. General uh, from the Air Force, and, and he, he had this. The beauty of this is short, but it really emphasizes continuing education. Communication, actively listening. And, and that's the leader sets the direction of the conversation. Self-evaluation. Folks, if you don't measure what you're doing, you don't improve. So every week you have to go back and look at what you did that week and say, what could I do better? All professionals need to recollect daily. I go home, I find my wife, and I sit down for 15 minutes, and I hear about all the 13 grandkids who live nearby, and I, Janie gets to tell me what's going on. And then I tell her what's going on. But you need to reconnect daily with the most important person in your life. And on I Give Leadership Seminars, that one gets more feedback than any of the rest. Okay, give your full attention that you're listening. Do an outstanding job, and a lot of people says, why is that one of those counterintuitive ones? When somebody does an outstanding job, it gives you a chance to compliment them. And then that leads in and you ask that person, what's your one more thing? Are you getting a master's degree? Are you teaching Sunday school? Are you, teaching a, a, are you getting a license? And so your outstanding people should be encouraged to do one more thing. And you as the boss, that's something that you should stress. You can't get angry. You gotta be calm. Think about it overnight, call the person in the morning. But people are pretty smart. If the colonel called you at seven o'clock in the morning, <laughs> they, they kind of figured out hell it wasn't good. But anyway, don't be angry. 
Training and education is an investment, not an expense. Companies, when they start cutting the budget, the first thing they want to do is cut training. Folks, you need to train your people, that's all of it. Open door policy, openness. If you have an open budget, you cut out rumors and you self-auditing and people can't cheat you when you have an open budget. So don't be private with the budget, keep it open. Build win-win relationships. You learn how to kiss all the cows in the pasture. Now, one old guy in the back of the room says, Professor, which end of the cow do I kiss? <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's something else. Everybody wants to be included in the corporate body. The more people you have in your corporate body, the more people are watching the store for you. Ideas. You want people to be working on their own ideas instead of yours. You have to be clever enough to find out they have a good idea and then sign it to them. Thinking. I have a chapter in the book on how to think, and I have 24 thinking comp, uh, comp, uh, statements. And, and so if you ask these statements to yourself and write down after three or four or five weeks, two months, those questions you ask yourself to force you to think are on your mind. And you'll be driving along and you'll be asking yourself some of these thinking questions. I like this, thinking is hardest work there is, which is probably the reason why so few people, so few people engage in it. Henry Ford. Okay, thinking partner, everybody should have one. You should think, you should be happy. In closing, DNA Leadership Book, 4th of September, 2018. The chapters are standalone. You can read them in any order. Uh, if you only have uh, 10 minutes, you read the last page in the book. If you have 30 minutes, you read the last chapter. Chapter six is learn from the masters. You have 110 wisdoms I got from the National Academy. Uh, then chapter who's on your molecule is how you fit in the company. Uh, and that seems to be a good exercise. Uh, leadership uh, and the PM we did a magic deck of action cards with 52 wisdoms. And then we asked you if you have a normal job, which 10 actions you would select. If you have a project from hell, which problems you should select. I won't tell you the cards you select and you read a few pages. That helps identify your tendencies of being a leader or a manager. Uh, the profile is 15 sets of uh, you uh, are very private, you don't share information, to very open and you share everything. And you, find, you place yourself 50%, 60, 80, whatever. You do these 15 extremes, and that will tell you whether you have a tendency to micromanage or you have a tendency to lead. That's the uh, CII sent us top level people training to be execs. And, and we did that, and, and that was the data that I used to write the chapter on how to think. Investing thinking time. Now these chapters cover each one of the categories, zero, one, two, three, four. And I wanna end on a safety note. At your age, you have to stay in physical fit. You have to handle the, the rail going down each time. At age 60, I never climbed a six-foot ladder again. Two weeks ago, I fell off of a two-foot ladder, and I don't climb a two-foot ladder anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do handiwork anymore. I, thank goodness, can afford to have it done for me, especially when you have a lot of son-in-laws. Anyway, folks, thank you very much.